This is To The Point. A Rhino experience. Voted one of the top home services marketing and operations podcasts. Cutting through the bullshit and getting to the point. Hey, what's up To The Point listeners? It's your boy, Chris, the host of To The Point Home Services podcast, along with my super tall and lengthy co-host, Mr. Tall Paul. Rep- hey, dude, in a button-down collared shirt, fluffy hair, the whole deal. He's back. What's is up, it, brother? Is it buttoned down or button up? I was just asking someone about that. I need to know. I button That's mine. actually a really good question. A button right? down or button up? Regardless, it's got a lot of buttons, and that is not how we roll at Rhino, sir. But it is a stupid <laughs> question, and it wouldn't be me without asking a stupid question. So good to see you, man. You have been a uh, traveling... <clears throat> gosh, I mean, you've been everywhere recently. Like I was home four days and three weeks, four wow. days and three weeks. Uh, our guest knows a little bit about that type of travel arrangement. <laughs> um, and actually our guest is uh, coming back for part two. We got Mr. Terry Nicholson, who's back on the show today, which we'll be finalizing part two. Part one was exceptional, Terry. The feedback was fantastic. And, um, and it was cool. Like Paul was saying, I was at Service World Expo and then I went to True Grit and I went down to RoofCon and I was over at a PHCC event and then a SCALT event, which I never even heard of before, South Carolina Association of Licensed Trades. I went and spoke there. That was that was an interesting meeting. Um, and it was good. Like I kind of took me back to some grassroots stuff. Oh yeah. Um, but everywhere I was going, man, people were saying they heard that episode with you, Terry. They so did. you're back to tell the back half of this story. We basically, basically took us through a history lesson. So for those listening who didn't catch Car- uh, Terry's first episode, that was episode number 88. And it is the industry legend that trained the industry legends. So no think about that for a second. So a lot of our biggest and most downloaded episodes with some of those guys, this guy's been a part of their training process. Like that's exceptional. Yeah. And, uh, and it was great for me to listen to and get a history lesson like, on the episode. So now I'm kind of anxious to dig more into it. So we're going to welcome back Mr. Terry Nicholson, who's the Chief Success Officer for Praxis S10. Terry, welcome back, my friend. Well, thanks for having me back. And I'm happy that people uh, gave you positive feedback. Mm. They, it's good. They did. It, we like that. We, we do. And really what we like, Terry, and we tell our, our listeners this all the time, you know, we don't always know a ton about our guests. We'll read the bios, but hearing your story firsthand, Chris and I were blown away at one, the learning and the inspiration that we get firsthand. But then to share that with the people, the, the newer generation of people who may have not met you yet or heard of you. And, and I thought I found this Thank after you. we talked last, and this is a way that Jim Abrams described you. And I thought it was like the perfect segue and you've got to be honored. So I'll, I'll share it. Um, But I'll I'll bring you back into episode two, introducing you the way Jim did. And he said, in the early 90s, a young man, Terry, approached me thirsty for knowledge and hungry for success. Ever since, I've been mentoring him and witnessed him developing into the greatest contracting educator of all time. He's the only individual to have been a contractor, served in a senior leadership position with a consolidator, a utility company an affinity group and a franchise. So listeners, welcome back, Terry Nicholson. So glad to have you. Hear the crowd. How can I not feel good after all that, Dan? Right. right, So I got the best end of that deal. Uh, That's very kind of Jim, but uh, I'm I'm the real winner in that equation. That's for sure. That's for sure. So let's do this. Listeners, if you have not listened to part one, please stop and go back and listen to part one so you can have the history. Because on today's episode, what we're going to go through is the present. What is Terry up to now? And what's in the future? So what I thought I would do is kind of tee this up for you, Terry, by asking a question about change. So you've seen change over the years. You've been in this a long time. Change has been a constant during your tenure. What's the biggest change or transformation? And what's the upcoming change that contractors need to prepare for? Okay. All right. Well, let's start there because, um, Let's go back to the 90s and even the 80s, because I think my answer is really going to be the evolution of advertising, because I know you've been in this business roughly 14, 15 years, I believe you both said. And uh, I know this is probably hard for you to imagine and probably a lot of your audience hard to imagine. But there was once a time when if you wanted to be found in the uh, contracting business, you had to be in something called a yellow page book. Yellow pages. Yeah. My kids don't even know what a yellow page book is. And, uh, one of the individuals that I don't think I referenced the last time was an individual by the name of John Young. 
And he was Jim Abrams' business partner. And he was the individual that really changed the format of advertising inside this industry. And he actually started producing these yellow page ads that were entirely different back in the 80s and the 90s as well. And back in those days, it was notorious. You put a big truck. If you were a plumber, you put a pipe wrench in your ad. Who would have thunk it? A plumber that owned the pipe wrench. And John would call that wasted real estate. And he would write these wordy yellow page ads with no pictures in them whatsoever. And the yellow page company would even try to talk our members out of running those ads. And they worked. And in fact, one of the advertisements he produced was just this small quarter page ad. And it became so powerful, many yellow page companies would not even run it. And the headline was, this small ad saves you money. And then it went on to explain that if you pick any advertiser that was bigger than this small ad, that you were going to pay him more money for the service because of the cost of the yellow page company. Because the cost of the ad, huh? And it was a awesome advertisement, which is why some companies wouldn't run it because the yellow page companies, they're not in the business of getting you more calls. They're in the business of selling ad space right. and they want people equally happy or equally upset and they don't care which. <laughs> Because if we're all happy or we're all upset, we'll all do about the same thing and go just a little bit bigger. So that was That's the profound. form of advertising that you had to master. But then the next step John took and brought into the industry direct mail. And to my knowledge, he is the individual who actually brought direct mail to the industry. And it was a unique style. It was different than any other type of direct mail. Once again, very long, wordy ads. And, you know, he would run advertisements and letters that were four pages, eight pages long. And contractors would say, no one's going to read that. And he said, no, they're not, except the people who want to buy what you have to buy. Yeah. And we actually built a whole business. In fact, service experts, that was one of the principles that it was founded on was direct response, direct letters, direct mail. And that became a billion dollar business during its peak with the primary form of advertising being direct response, direct mail. So you initially had to be good at Yellow Pages. Then you had to transition to direct response. And in fact, um, you referenced last time, Leland, and I was thinking this uh, the other day because I knew you would ask me a question like this. And I remember when Leland sold his first business uh, to ARS and then he retired and went out and rode off into the sun for a while. And then he came back and became a client. In his first year of doing business, he did over $4 million of revenue. Brand new startup company from scratch, no clients, and did over $4 million the very first year. And I remember bringing him up on stage at the end of that one year and just sharing with people, Leland, just say what you did. And, you know, one of the questions everyone wanted to know was, what type of marketing did you do? And you know how I share with you, Leland's really smart, really humble, and really you know, yep. laid back. His response was, guys, I'm not too smart. And I can't do a lot of things extremely well. So I decided to do a few things very, very well. If I want maintenance, I run this one postcard right here that John Young created. If I want replacement leads, I run this one letter right here that John Young wrote for me. And all we do is run these two letters every single month, 12 months out of the year. And then we make sure that we execute at a very high level. So direct response was the next avenue that you had to advance to and make sure you were good at. Then we started teaching people radio and we started transitioning radio and it became a big part of our ad spin in our own companies as well. And then obviously the next step was TV and you had to get really good at TV if you were gonna build a big company and then I think the game changer was really the branding. And really for all practical purposes, Jim and John started the branding purpose at Service Experts when we went public, but we didn't really teach that to the clients because at the time there wasn't a lot of clients that was big enough that you could even employ a branding strategy. But then we started bringing branding to the organization. The other one, and uh, you referenced Chris that you were on air ghetto, right? Right. And you said that you knew he had a purpose. Did you ever find out what that purpose was, why he wanted you for two hours? I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> but based on your answer, you don't want to share it, it appears? Nah. No. Uh -uh. Okay. I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get asked to, to do that meeting again. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, last okay. 
All right. Well, then I won't put you on the spot unless you ask me something really tough that I can't answer. Then I'm going to come back to Eric. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 24 right, 7 KG. But, but the reason why I ask about the Air Ghetto is, you know, I had shared with you, I met Ken when he's a relatively small company, but we also brought an individual into the industry that's now become famous in the industry by the name of Roy Williams. Williams, yeah. right. Okay. The Wizard oh, yeah. of Ads. Wizard and of Ads. If I'm not mistaken, that's who Ken is still tapped into today. Well, yep. we introduced Roy Williams to uh, Ken and we introduced Roy to the entire group. And, you know, once again, some people hear the message. Some people don't hear the message. But Leland was in that room. Jimmy Hiller was in that room. Dave Geiger was in that room. Ken was in that room. They heard the message and they understood this branding message and they turn their company into a form of branding advertisement, including like Ken, he went and hired Roy Williams directly. Now, what the industry probably doesn't know is Roy was really famous. Well, I'll ask you guys, do you know what Roy was famous for before he got into this industry? I forget. Yeah. Jewelry. I did not Diamond. know that. Yeah. Diamond Jewelry. engagement rings and necklaces and all this stuff. And so when John Young and Jim Abrams first oh. approached Roy Williams, and the way John, and once again, it's about being in the right place, hearing the message, and smart enough to recognize it. Roy was running an advertisement for a jewelry company in Kansas City, Missouri, where John Young listened and lived. And John said, that guy would be spectacular for our industry. And I have this concept on branding. We just need a branding expert to help us take it to another higher level. And Roy wanted nothing to do with it. In fact, he said, I like selling things that people want to buy. Diamond rings, diamond necklaces, things that make people happy. No one wants to buy that crap you guys sell, which was heating <laughs> air conditioning. Right. <laughs> and, and his answer was no. And Not he on had nothing to do with this industry, but uh, Jim and John being smart like they were, they listened. And in that meeting that they had with him that day, Roy unveiled that he had a indoor air quality problem inside of his home and he had this pollution and didn't know what to do about it. Well, we happen to know something about that. <laughs> so we actually went out, even though Roy had told us no, we went out and hired one of our members. I called him up and I said, this is what Roy needs at his house. Charges full price. We'll pay for it. Just go to his house and put it in. We called Roy and told him what we were doing. And Roy's always willing to take free solutions to his air pollution problems. So <laughs> he accepted it. And he called us back about a week later. Obviously, he felt a little bit obligation, and he thanked us, and he said it's better than it's ever been. He thought it was snake oil, but now that he recognized the value of it, hey, I love this stuff. But that wasn't the, the, sit, or the deal sealer here. The deal sealer was we talked with one of his assistants and found out that Roy is a connoisseur of fine wine. Not that uh, sheep herder stuff you drink, Paul. Okay. No, just kidding. I don't know it's if going to box. Great, all right. I just wanted to keep this somewhat entertaining. Five bucks, Chuck. Uh, it, five it's bucks true. Chuck. <laughs> but Roy, wine. Roy loved fine wine. So we found out what this uh, particular fine wine was, and we sent him a case, and it is very, very expensive. And about the third bottle deep into it, Roy called us up and said, okay, maybe I will work with you guys. Oh boy. <laughs> to three yeah. bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a little more history on the branding of this industry and Roy Williams and how Ken became connected to Roy Williams in the industry. And so what I want to stress is you had to get good at branding. And if you look at all the big guys across the United States today, yep. they all became masters in branding. Yep. The, oh, yeah. The healers. I mean, everyone that I've already referenced. So yep. that evolution of change has, has really changed the industry and built huge, big, dynamic, growing companies. And you can't find a big company that doesn't understand branding today. And you'll never build a big company like these 100 plus million dollar companies unless you understand the branding principle. Now, the fundamentals are still all the same. I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to even talk about it, whether you want to do yellow pages, direct mail or radio, TV, branding, et cetera. The, the formula still hasn't changed. It's still a, right. it's grab the attention, 
then it's got to be entertaining enough or interesting enough that they'll listen to it and then desire. And then they got to take action and be willing to at least set up the appointment to find out about it. So you have to have that. But uh, even though I went through that, so my answer is going to be advertising. But if I brought 10 people together that were contractors that were not affiliated with Praxis S10, and I brought them into a room and I said, tell me about your biggest challenges. It would be one of two, would always be number one and number two when we total up the boat. And it would either be, I can't find good help. That would probably be number one on their list or number two. But usually number one actually is above, I can't find good help. And it's, I need more marketing. Yeah. And that's what everyone always tells me is, if I had better marketing, I need more marketing. And, you know, I always tell people that when they join us for the very first time, that it may be true, but I always open up with a little story here, if I may. And so if I may indulge you, it's about this, uh, and it's a little poem, and it's about this lion that met this tiger. And the poem goes like this. A lion met a tiger while he drank beside the pool. Said the tiger to the lion, why are you always roaring like a fool? That's not foolish, said the lion with a twinkle in his eyes. They call me the king of beasts because I advertise. A rabbit overheard and ran home like a streak. He thought he'd give the lion's method a try, but his roar was just a squeak. A rabbit or a fox overheard the rabbit squeal and came to investigate and had a rabbit luncheon in the woods. The moral of the story, <laughs> my friends, if you're going to advertise, make sure you got the goods. And... <laughs> So many contractors think the answer to their business is, I need more marketing. And the reality is, almost all of them have enough revenue, enough calls, enough opportunities, and they're crawling over and through and around more revenue than they're picking up because they don't know how to maximize those opportunities. And that's why our first business lesson when a person comes in is called maximum yield. It's how to take the exact number of telephone calls and dispatch those differently, field those differently, and get them in the right people's hands. And many contractors can double or even triple their revenue because they're not operating at maximum yield. Now, imagine if you're a million-dollar company and you can do $1.5 million without advertising one more dollar, the financial impact that'll have on your company. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I literally just I just had this this conversation, so it's it's cool to hear you say that, and it's something that I've been preaching for years um, that I, you have been. I mean, you're obviously been it longer than me, but at least the the 14 years I've been in business, it's been the same thing. And I and I got I love when I get the opportunity to talk about this. Like, um, I was doing a keynote, and I like to pull in tracking and reporting because I love tracking and reporting. And I was talking about how uh, a lot of times, like to your point, Terry, you're saying people are just trying to keep throwing money at it to fix a problem. And that's not really the problem. Like you could not spend another dollar and you start to work on some of those things internally, like your average tickets or, or your processes or whatever it is that you can to, to maximize what you're already doing. I look at it from the perspective of when, if somebody uses a, a service Titan or a house call pro or whatever they're using for their field management software, they'll look at closed revenue and then make a decision based off of closed revenue versus looking at, well, what was the total actually opportunity that had come in for new business that was missed? So I like to see what's the gap. And then let's just focus on that gap between the two. And I guarantee you, we're going to start to pick apart problems without spending one more dollar on anything to fix your, I use air quotes, lead problem. So I'm glad to hear you say it. I still deal with it to this day, but I feel like with the, anybody who has like their, their branding on point, um, during COVID, number one, during COVID, you probably felt the impact of that if it wasn't. So hopefully you're starting to make some moves forward with it. But every single customer that we have that has a phenomenal brand has an exceptional campaign. There can't be like, that can't just be a fluke. Like it, it, it's somebody who's really spent time on that brand and the story behind it. Right. They're successful. So, but it's still like, I want to go down that path because I love what I, I call the gap. And, and I try to open everybody's eyes to, you cannot just look at your, at your closed revenue and then make a decision on that's how your marketing company or your marketing manager or whoever, you can't judge them based on that until you've looked at the actual opportunity. What was the booking rate for that drain cleaning lead? What was the booking rate for your, uh, for your install leads that hit came in? And, and was this through pay-per-click? Was it through SEO? Was it through your direct? What was it? Like, let's dig into the details and find out where are the gaps within our current process and fix those first before we spend another dollar. 
All right. So I, I want to go back to something you said, just kind of you, you breezed over the fact that Leland was a client at one point, And then you mentioned Ken and you mentioned Dave, I'm assuming those were clients in the contractor success group era, right? The first, well, two of them were, and that yep. was Leland and Dave. And then, um, Ken was Plumber Success International was the first organization that he was in. And then we had an air conditioning organization after that. He became part of that as well. Got it. So let's use that as a transition to talk about Praxis S10. So the same person who was coaching and mentoring these type of people years ago, now we're doing this through Praxis S10. Um, what is Praxis S10 and kind of tell that story if you can. And tell me about what it means to be custom built, which I pulled from some of the material. Ooh. Okay. All right. Well, Praxis S10, it's really more than a name. In fact, it at our name is really the core value of who we are. And if I may, I'll, I'll share with you exactly what Praxis is. Uh, Praxis is actually a word that means the application of proven knowledge. And the S of Praxis S10, S stands for success, victory, achieving the desired result, and then the 10 on a scale of one to 10 is what most people evaluate as a perfect score if you can achieve a 10. So when you put it all together, what Praxis S10 is all about is the proven application of real life principles that will help you improve and build a better business. It's not theory, it's not hype, it's not this, hey, we think this will work. It is real life principles that have been time tested and proven. And in fact, my business partner, Jimmy Hiller, is our partner in Praxis S10. And he's applying those same principles in his business. And if you're part of Praxis S10, not only will Praxis S10 teach you the principle and you'll gain the principle, but now for those individuals who learn better by seeing it in action, they can now go to Jimmy Hiller's business and they can actually see the exact principles that we're teaching being implemented inside Jimmy's business. And I don't hey, know. Hey, Terry, if, real quick. Hey, Terry, yes, real sir. quick. Can you, can you, will you let the listeners know just about like, give them some context on Jimmy's business, just so if they don't know who, who Jimmy is, like for some reason, but just like, what kind of, what kind of business is Jimmy's? And you know, now that Size, you bring that, things up. I'm going to tie something together there because in that same room, I shared with you that Dave and Leland were in and Ken, Jimmy Hiller was in that room. The only difference right. was Jimmy Hiller was a $200,000 service company when I first met him in 1999. He was approximately $230,000 in debt. He was basically bankrupt. He was just too stubborn to give up and know that he was bankrupt. And, <laughs> and when he came and he joined our organization, in fact, it was humorous because he brought a guy with him. And the whole purpose of that guy was, don't let me write a check. Don't let me pay these guys. And at the end of the meeting, <laughs> I'm the guy standing up on stage, giving him an invitation to come and join our business. And uh, the guy's going, don't write him a check. Don't write him a check. And I asked for some amount of money and Jimmy didn't have it. And Jimmy came up and he visited with me and he waited until everyone was basically gone. And he said, I can give you a $500 check, Terry, but I need you to hold it until Wednesday. Now, this is a Saturday. And he said, if you give me till Wednesday, he said, I'll find the money and I'll come up with the money. And as Jimmy wow. tells the story, he said, I knew you were a man of character then because I didn't expect you to hold the check because I've had people say they would do it and run straight to the bank and cash it. Cash and it. you not only waited, you waited until Friday to take the uh, check. So he said, I knew right there I was dealing with a person of integrity. And he said, but I also was smart enough to realize after being in business all these years and being this much in debt, that what I was doing wasn't working. And I was already working hard. I just needed someone to point me in the right direction and share with me what to do. If you tell me what to do, I'll do it. And that's what our organization was really all about. And so we would tell Jimmy what to do. And today he's 125 plus million dollar regional powerhouse and based out of Nashville, Tennessee is his home office. So any quite the transformation on Jimmy on that? <laughs> I, I think I'm, we're clear. Yeah. yeah. And it, Jimmy's ahead, one Paul. of those legendary guys that you just assume he just started right there. Like I've, anytime I've looked at Hiller, I'm like, they've always been like, that's yeah, where he Hiller is. is. He landed there. It's where he was born, but that's incredible. <laughs> and you made me think of two other points there that if I could add to that as well is, um, you know, I'd share with you, we were non-competed and we were 
building the physical therapy and balance centers, you know, and they sponsored yep. the last promotion. Right. Heard Paul is what Paul yeah, said. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. This, <laughs> this episode brought to you by it's physical therapy and balance you. centers. <laughs> well, when, when our non-compete expired and we knew that we were able to now go and get back in this business, we had a decision to make. We had this decision. Do we go and build our own operational business? Because I want to stress, unlike so many people in the industry that say they're experts, but they've never operated a business or own a business, that hasn't been our model. Our business model has always been, we do what we teach you to do. You can come and see it in action. and We're not going to teach what we're not doing. So we knew it would take us a couple of years to build back a business to any size that people would want to say, these guys know what they're doing. Or the second answer was we could partner with one of our best clients. And I made the decision to partner with Jimmy Hiller, one of the best students that we've ever had. And I went and approached Jimmy and said, Jimmy, we'd love to be your business partner. Praxis S10 will be the principals. You'll be the model that will evidence and share with everyone how to implement the principles. It's been a wise decision. He's a great guy to work with. He's a great partner. He's humble. He's willing. He shares and he shares his knowledge and time with the Praxis S10 members. So now I'm ready to answer, if I may, the yep, next heck yeah. part of the question, Paul, yeah, if that's okay. And your question sure. was in, in detail, what's the difference or, or what does Praxis S10 do? Yeah. Well, when we were out of the business and building our physical therapy business, we still love this industry. And I mean, there was this draw. And as I share with you, people kept calling and asking for advice and guidance that even though we weren't in the business. And so anyway, one of the things that we discussed was why was it that we'd have all these people in a room? Ken would hear the message. Jimmy would hear the message. Or Leland would hear the message. But so many other people didn't hear the message. And then we started saying, well, there's lots of reasons. And so what we did was we took all of our knowledge from the past years and we built Praxis S10 to help more people and widen that gap. And I think that what makes us really different is we're not a best practice organization. And in the past, we were more of a best practice organization and a best practice organization they may give you multiple what considered the best practice. There may be five, 10 different ways to do one thing. But what Praxis S10 is strategic mentoring. And to my knowledge, we are really the only organization that is strategic mentoring. And what that means is, depending on where you're at, you have to be who you are where you're at. Meaning if you're a million dollar business, you're going to do things entirely different than a $10 million business. If you're a $10 million business, you're going to do things entirely different than a $100 million business. Makes so sense. step one of Praxis S10 is getting people to identify what they want to accomplish out of their business. And that's really where it all starts. And we tell people your business is a vehicle to get you what you want out of life. Nothing more, nothing less. When our, and I always joke around with uh, our people and I say, you know, I'm going to share with you a secret you didn't know. None of us are getting out of this world alive. Can you imagine when your day gets cold and you're at the pearly gates there and they ask you, do you have any regrets? Yes, I do. I wish I'd have spent 20 more hours a week at the office. <laughs> and I don't think anyone's ever going to say that. So there's where your business really starts with what do you want to accomplish? And we're really good at helping business owners that have never had a game plan. We actually call it a success blueprint. Identify what it is they want to accomplish. And that's step one. And if we can get people to do that, then it's we can help them build a business that will allow them to have everything they want. And now it's not really the frustration of the business that's beating them down because this is a tough industry. And anybody that's been in this business for any length of time and operated a business that's still in business, then you're a good contractor and you're a good person because it is a tough industry and not a lot of people can do it. But if they now encounter one of those challenges, it's not, I have this business problem. I want to go to happy hour and drink it off. It's, man, I want to get this vacation home for my family and I'm going to fight through it and I'm going to get inspired to do what I have to do to make it happen. So that's step one 
What is it you want? Step two is strategic mentoring, which is experts, people like Jimmy, people like myself, people on my team here, sharing with those individuals, here's exactly what you need to do to help you achieve what you want. And when they get into a challenge, I mean, I had a client the other day that was in a really tough bind. And it was one of those things that I'd already been in before. So it was easy to go. The answer is simple. Just go do this. Now, it wasn't simple to him, but it was simple to me because we've already been there, done it, seen it. So that's what Praxis S10 is all about. So Jimmy was, Jimmy's been the longstanding case study. Oh, and absolutely. From, so from really running, you know, this small, really negative, running in the negative business all up to 100, and I think, I can't remember, you said 123, four, five, somewhere around there, 26, somewhere a million, you're hitting all these different pinnacles along the way, but you already kind of had an idea of what to expect, except for you still, you basically put the old uh, Praxis S10 model to work on Jimmy's company. And then every phase of the way, you've got basically a case study all the way up. Like, so he's probably, is it still work in progress in like, where else can we go with this thing? Well, when I started working with him again in 2016, I'll let you answer the question, Chris. He was approximately okay. a $84 million business. Today, he's $125 million. Got it. Got it. I think that, I think that answers my question. <laughs> it's just- And the bigger I'm you get, the, the harder it is to have those types of growth. Yeah, those you, are big. I mean, that's a, that's a big jump. Do you find that some of the people that come in when you go through the process of helping them identify like what is it they want out of their business and out of their life, do they have a hard time defining those things or are there common themes that we all kind of want? We all want a little more time. We all want, like, what are people chasing? What would make you think that it would be difficult for people to identify what they want? I think people can get so far into the business and not see what is actually possible. I've had conversations with, with owners who have just operated in a silo for so long that they don't know that life doesn't have to be this hard and they don't know that work doesn't have to be this hard. So that's why I asked that question. Well, I also think that it's a misunderstanding of what you really want versus like or what you think you want versus what yeah. you what you really want. Cause you're like, oh, I want to have this, you know, hundred million dollar company. Well, do you? Like at what cost? Like, well, you know, what do you want to do? I just mm -hmm. think it's a misunderstanding as well. And Paul, I was actually kidding with you there a little bit because that is actually the biggest hurdle that we've got to start with day one is getting people to identify exactly what they want. So I was actually just having a little bit of fun, but you said yeah. some good things there that open up uh, a new direction that we can take with that. Because first of all, I agree with you hundred percent. In fact, we call this industry the great dream killer, because mm -hmm. when you open up your business day one, you're so full of enthusiasm. You're so excited. You're going to go out and conquer the world. And you're going to have this great freedom of time. You're going to live in these great big homes and you're going to have this wealth and you're going to be your own boss. And you're going to get to do what you want, when you want, how you want. And then reality sets in and this business just kicks the living snot out of people. I did say snot, kicks the living snot out of people. <laughs> And all of a sudden, people start lowering their expectations, and they go a few more years, and they lower their expectations, and then they start telling themselves little white lies, and the little white lies sound like this. You know, I, I really have everything I wanted. All I really ever wanted to be was my own boss. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to do what I wanted when I wanted, and I don't report to anyone, so I can't. Now, it's not true, but they tell themselves that. Because it helps them overcome where their high dreams were when they went into the business to where they're at today. So to answer your question, there is a method that is real simple. And we start out because there are a couple of core principles that you can, not principles, but items that most people evaluate their success on. So if they've never done a blueprint, they can't decide what they want. I say, well, let's start with question number one. Let's start with the easy one. What type of income do you want to make at the end of this year? What type of income do you want to make in five years? Most people can get that answer right. And then we say, what type of home do you want to live in? 
Do you live in your dream home today? If you do, skip the question. If you don't, then write down what type of dream home that you want to live in. Do you want to have a vacation home? And I find that people in our industry, there's a ton of individuals that have these lake homes and uh, they, they want to get away or they have cabins in the woods that are, are their retreats. And they know a lot of people in these industries have those. So that's usually the next question. And then we're fortunate at our office here in Sarasota because we have a, um, in fact, let me look out the window because I forgot the name, Ultra Luxury Automotive Group next door. And inside that place that I can see out the window over there, they have Bentleys, they have Ferraris, they have Rolls Royces, they have all these vehicles that are anywhere, you know, 500,000, 750,000. And I tell people, I said, at the next break, if you don't know what type of automobile you want to drive, walk across the street, get some inspiration, and then come back over. And then we'll go to work. <laughs> get some inspiration. <laughs> so if we start with those questions, Paul, we can usually get people to write down what they want. And now it becomes easy because now it's just tactical at that point because it's okay if you want to make this income, this is the amount of revenue that you need to be producing at X profitability to earn this type of income. If you want this lake home, then this is how much your business is going to have to produce on top of that to generate this income. So now we can build them a one, three, five, and even 10 year plan. And back to Jimmy to give you your viewing audience a little more excitement and enthusiasm again. Remember, $200,000 of service in 1999. Approximately six years later, he's a $4 million residential service business. At that point in time, he got serious about that lesson, which was approximately 2005. And he said, I'm going to build a $50 million business. He did build a $50 million business in about eight more years. Then he said, so that would be, what, 14? And then he set a new goal that he was going to build a $100 million business. He exceeded that one relatively quickly. Now he set a new goal, and he still, and I don't even like to use the word goal, forget I said goal, because goal is a New Year's resolution, you know, that, okay, it's, it's in total today because I'm drinking, tomorrow it's gone. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a commitment. When you build a budget, a plan, it's a commitment. Yeah. And, and if it's real, which I think that was the word you used, Paul, if these items are real to them, they'll do what's necessary. And it was real. It was real to Jimmy every step of the way. And you got to understand, Jimmy has his personal motivation. Because when he first started his business, after being in business, and I'm not sure if it was nine months or a year or something like that, his family had an intervention with him. And I probably shouldn't tell you this story because you probably ought to get Jimmy on and he ought to just tell you the story. So you want me not tell you this, leave the hook or you want me to keep going? Fire we'll away. <laughs> Fire away. Fire away. Okay. Well, Jimmy's family had an intervention. His father, and I believe it was his father's best friend, sat down with Jimmy and said, Jimmy, it's time you go get a real job. You can't make a living in this business. And with tears rolling down his face, Jimmy gets up and says, if I quit on this, I'll have a tendency to quit on everything the rest of my life, and I'm not quit. Not a boy, Jimmy. Not so, a boy, Jimmy. So these things that gave him a little motivation. Jimmy. We've got to yeah, get him like, on here. That's a, That little a fire. Yeah, we got to get him on here, too. Um, I've never met him. I've always I've only ever heard great things, but I've never met him. I know a guy who could probably help you. <laughs> you know I figured, I figured you might, might be able to do that. So this question is not in our pre-production form, but I want to talk about it. Um, with the rise of social media and the internet and Zoom and you know everybody connecting across the industry, um, it's a different playing field for groups like mentor companies, best practice, best practice groups, buying groups. And I feel like there are, um, the, the water can be a little muddy. And the reason I'm saying that is, I will see people say, Hey, I need to hire a coach. Who do you recommend in a group or whatever? And someone will recommend this person and this person, and this person, and they're not all equal. It's not all Apple. They're not all coaches. They're not all mentors. Should I join this group or this agency? So give me your perspective on the state of resources that are available to contractors to help them grow today. 
and also just kind of your perspective on, you know, the, just the coaching and all the different resources, I guess. Yeah, I see where you're going with that because um, we see it all the time in the, in the different social media groups that we're involved in, Terry, and it's, you know, and, and I think everybody answers like pretty general for the most part. You've got some who are part of a group who will champion their groups, but I think it, it matters on what is your preference. Like, well, I guess what kind, what are you looking for? Who's best at what? But there's a lot of, I use air quotes, consultants that have no business being consultants and they're legit building like businesses this way, which I think is a disservice to the industry. Um, but that's why he's asking that question. So we see a lot of that stuff. And I think if anybody has a, a really great uh, perspective on that or perception on that or, or just advice on that, that would be you. Well, first of all, I will say this, that there are some really good organizations and I would encourage you to be part of some organization, any type of organization. That's a legit organization. And the reason why I preface that is, you know, I look back on it and, you know, Dave's a perfect example. He was in multiple organization groups. And the reason why is in the big scheme of things, whether it's a best practice group or whether it's Praxis S10, the, the investment to be in the organization is so nominal compared to what you're going to get out of it. And it just makes sense to be into it. But I don't know of any large contractor that's ever achieved, and, and let's even make it mid-sized. I don't know of any contractor above $20 million in annual revenue that's a true retail residential service contract that's not in some best practice organization. So I don't have to be a rocket scientist to wake up and go, if I want to be $20 million plus, I need to be in a best practice organization. Now, yep. there are a couple of people that claim they're not, but they're in chat rooms or they're heading chat rooms up and they're spending a lot of time studying and gaining knowledge. So there are no self-made people in this industry. And anyone who says they're a self-made person in this industry is probably going to lie about other things in their personal life as well. All right. Ooh, so wrong. my <laughs> philosophy is, uh, okay. We liked it. Right. We're giving thumbs up to the All listeners. Right. I, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know yeah. if you were going to like disconnect me now. Nope, or nope, we like nope. It. We believe I was it giving the mic, mic drop is what I was giving you. I didn't have a microphone to drop, nor would yeah. I. They're expensive. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. Tony. All right. So I think you ought to be in some organization, whether it's ours or someone else. Now, to answer your question, and I, you know, keep in mind, you said this, I'm not self-serving. You're asking me the question. Really, that's one of the reasons why Praxis S10 exists today in the format that it exists on, because we looked at and said, why are some people failing? and in, in our prior organization, and they're not in this one. Well, let's go back to our prior organization. We used to charge people a la carte for training. If you want to send your person away for sales training, $3,000. You want to send your technician to learn how to be a selling technician, $2,500. You want to send your person away for fill in the blank. We had a price tag on it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, any ideas who the client that paid us the most amount of money was for training? No clue. Um, let's see, Geiger or? He was probably second. Number one <laughs> was Jimmy Hiller. Yeah. Oh, Jimmy I guess that Hiller makes sense. was paying us annually more money than anyone else to send his people through our training program. Mm -hmm. Is it any coincidence? He right. became one of the largest. See, he was making an investment in his time in his people, and that investment was reaping rewards. I mean, do you really care about spending $3,000 for a training program if the guy learns how to sell $2 million? Right. You're an idiot Push if on. you think that's too much money, all right? right. So, however, when we said, look, and, and I'll use my kids, for example. I've got three kids that I shared with you. Two of them have already graduated from University of Florida. One of them's at the University of Florida today. And it and this is prior to COVID. This was even, even though the, the two older ones have been out of UF for four or five years, something like that, they had the option for most of their classes to attend them three ways. One, they could wake up in the morning, put a baseball cap on if they wanted and go to class and see it live. Two, they could wake up, stay in their pajamas and turn on the monitor and watch the class live from their room on TV. Or three, they could sleep through it wake up when they wanted, turn on the monitor 
and watch a post time delayed video of the entire class. And you know what UF doesn't care? They don't care which method you take as long as you can evidence the knowledge to pass the test. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting here building Praxis S10 University and going, my, in our former organization, the $3,000 wasn't the expense. The expensive part was take a person to fly them across the country, the hotel room, the three days away from work, the time away from their family. What if we could build an online portal that would contain everything that we teach in the classroom was also online, like people are destined to learn today and people learn off their smartphone today, right? And that's what we did. So we built Praxis S10 to be an online portal that you could get all the training you need for your people. And we have what we consider two different categories, general management, and underneath general management, we have all the service management and there's any type of service management position you'd have from the client care specialist to the dispatch manager to the service manager installation, ops manager, fill in the blank. They can be educated online if they want that. And then we have the frontline people. And our objective is to build the world's greatest service professional, whether that be a client care specialist, dispatcher, service technician, uh, salesperson, et cetera, and they can get the training multiple ways. If they're the type of person that they want to get it in a live, inundated information, hey, come to the program. We'll be in that room for three or four days, whatever it is, and you can get it immersed in the information and walk out with a sponge head about ready to explode. Or if you want to get it in bite-sized pieces and watch it in modules, you can watch it in modules on our platform. Or if you want to come to the live class and then reinforce it with the modules, which is how you'll get the highest results of it. Mm -hmm. So I've had many people tell me, you knew we were going to have COVID, didn't you? And I said, yeah, sure. It was so obvious. That's why we built the Praxis SDN University online to give people the advantage. So where a lot of companies now had to transition, we were already there. Yeah. It was already something that was already done. So whether that's great visionary, whether that's being lucky, hey, I'll take either one. But we're bringing sure. people our value proposition, however they need it in that format. So did that answer your question? It did. It awesome. did. Chris, do you mind if I jump in one more? Can I skip ahead here? Yeah, far away. So when you're with a group of contractors now and they're hungry for you know, insight, like what's coming, what's next, what do they need to be thinking about? What should be keeping them up at night? Um, what is that? What's the biggest opportunity for HVAC or home service contractors? What are they not even thinking about right now that they should be? They won't like my answer. Are you oh, sure I'm so excited to hear it. I'm excited to hear it. <laughs> um, does that mean you want my answer, even though it yes. may not be uh, the answer. user friendly or listener friendly? No, we want the authentic version from you, Terry, please. And I guess uh, I ought to preface this as, you know, I always tell people, I say, you know, I'm not here to be your friend. I got enough friends. If you're serious about uh, improving your business and you want to know what it takes to improve your business, then you need to know two things about Terry. The good thing is Terry's always going to tell you what he thinks. The bad news about Terry is he's always going to tell you what he thinks. Tell you what he thinks. <laughs> Whether you want to hear it or not. I don't really believe it's about the industry at all, Paul. I think what they need to understand that they never want to look at is their best and biggest opportunity for improving their business comes down to what I'll call external focus versus internal focus. Mm -hmm. And the external focus business owner, they're always looking externally outside their business. They're blaming their technicians. I can't get my text to do this. Can't get my call taker to do this. I can't get them to sell a club membership. I can't get them to fill in the blank. All right. They're blaming the Democrats. They're blaming the Republicans. They're blaming the economy. They're blaming the, the weather. They're always pointing their finger externally. Now, now, the individuals that are building their business and are leapfrogging and growing by leaps and bounds every year, they're taking an internal focus and they understand the key to their futures are themselves. They understand that their deficiencies of their people are a deficiency of their own management skills because ultimately at the end of the day, who's the individual that hires the employees that work at that business? The owner or the managers. 
and the owner hired the managers, right? Who's the person responsible for training those people? The owners or the management or the leadership team. Who's the person responsible for holding them accountable? The owner's responsible for managing the managers. Manager's responsible for accounting and managing for the people. So if you don't like your people, then it's a personal issue. It's not a people issue. It's you have a deficiency in your recruiting, hiring, motivation, and management skills. And so, you know, as I already shared with you, when we first met Jimmy, he was really a small company, but Jimmy was willing to swallow his ego, which was part of the Praxis S10, which I think I left it out. But on a scale of one to 10, we've identified these principles. And if you'll set your ego aside, and truly evaluate yourself on these skill levels on a scale of one to 10, if you can get above 9.5 in all 10 of these areas, you're going to achieve phenomenal success. Yeah. And the average business owner does not want to accept responsibility for where their business is and who their business is. And I think um, it was probably John Maxwell that made the law of capacity famous. He didn't invent the concept. He just made it famous. So kudos to John Maxwell for taking a principle that had been around for years and making it famous, but the law of capacity, and I know you all know it, but for the viewing audience who may not be familiar with it, it says on a scale of one to 10, if your business is a three and you want to become an eight, then you have to elevate the leadership capacity to an eight. And then you have a chance of elevating your company to an eight. But if you're a three, the best your business is ever going to be is a three if your leadership capability is a three. So I literally just heard John share this uh, last week. He kept talking about that being the ceiling. Like if your leadership is at an eight, you're going to keep hitting, keep hitting the ceiling. Yeah, like the lid. He was just talking through this whole thing like literally last week. It's pretty cool. Well, he's a smart dude and he's got it down. So he's your friend. Thing- he's your friend. <laughs> One of the things that is uh, really exciting is, and this is true, and and there's the beautiful thing about being in this business as the same for you in your business. When you get to help other people, the person who's learning it best is you, the instructor. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we have challenges in our business, I'm so excited because I get to go stand in the mirror. And my lovely wife says, quit looking at yourself. You're not that good looking. And I said, no, I'm doing counseling right now. And see, I like to write the problem on the top of my mirror. Because any problem that I have in this business and for the viewing audience, any problem that you're having in your business today, if you'll set your ego aside and you'll truly admit it, that problem is directly related to you. But you know what's exciting about this? I can take that and erase problem across the top of my mirror And now I can write solution on the mirror and I can stand there in front of the mirror and I can say, it's exciting to know the solution to all my problems is staring at me right here in this mirror. And for the viewing audience today, the same is true for them. They are the problem, but they're also the solution. The solution. That's good. That's like the key to humankind right there too, not to get too philosophical, but like that's what's wrong with the country. Internal good, versus TV. external locus of control. And I appreciate your support, but I will not be running for president in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholson Yano, 2024. <laughs> yeah, Nicholson Yano, I don't think so. <laughs> so out of, res- be. out of respect for your time, I want to uh, kind of go back to the macro a little bit. I think you've done a really good job of, of sharing what Praxis S10 is. And for our listeners who who weren't familiar, now you are, now you, now you know, and you'll share at the end how to, how to get a hold of you. But Looking back on your career, what was the pinnacle moment or what has been the pinnacle moment so far? Well, I'm going to go with your first question. What, what is the pinnacle moment? I don't think that's written yet because the story still continues. And, you know, to use a quote from Ricky Bobby of Talladega Nights, you know, he said, with today's medical advancements and my money, I might be able to live to be 150. 200 is not out of the question. I mean, I'm only 57. I mean, can you imagine? I, I still got another 100 years, according Absolutely. to Rick Bobby, right? <laughs> That's dangerous. So, so you may have to call me back in 100 years for another podcast, and then I'll answer the pinnacle question. Book it, Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, good, then Ricky Bobby. Then I'll ask the other side of that question, and that is, what was the most difficult event or season or thing you went through? And what's your perspective on that particular situation now? 
You just had to go there, didn't you? You, you just did. you take a knife Tried and you stab me right there. Just bring it back down. Well, that's yeah. why we're we're going to give you the opportunity to share your perspective on it now. Was was it uh, as bad as you thought it was? Well, it's actually been a blessing. It, it wasn't a blessing at the time, but obviously it was a, a problem and a solution opportunity that we just discussed. And so if I could, I'll answer the question, but I also want to give the viewers some value here today. So I think it's a wonderful lesson that everyone can learn from. And uh, from, you know, and it doesn't mean probably the people that are tuned in today perhaps are better operators than I am in business, but history has taught me that probably every year in business, you're going to have at least one major challenge, maybe even as many as three major challenges in business. And some of those may actually even be business threatening situations. And when I look back on our days, and that's the one thing that Jim Abrams was always a great inspiration to me on, was making me aware that there, every business owner is going to encounter challenges. And even if we have leadership teams tuned in today that may not be owners, you're expected on the management team to figure out how to overcome those challenges. And there's always solutions, but to answer your question personally, we actually, and I'm not going to tell you the business, but it is one of those businesses we've had in the past. And uh, I'm not going to reference the name because I want to protect the guilty, the person who was responsible for managing that business. We actually lost a million dollars in one year from this one business. Now, it was a relatively startup business, but still, when you lose a million dollars of revenue, it hurts, you know, unless maybe you're, you know, the who's the guy who owns Tesla, whatever that guy's name. Or Elon Jeff Musk. Bezos. You know, maybe those guys lose a million dollars and it's nothing to them, but a million dollars is still a million dollars to most people, all right? And Jim taught me a lesson right there, all right? The lesson that he brought us into the room, and there were only a few people that were involved in this meeting, but the lesson is in any business, if you are having a struggle and you're losing money, you only have three options. Close it sell it or fix it. And those are your only three options. But to stand by and continue to throw, and you used a word that Jim used to use all the time, Paul, which was, you can't just keep throwing money at things. That's not the answer. And so we'd lost a million dollars. We brought the few executive people in the room, which was really three of us. And we discussed this million dollars that we had lost. We discussed the business venture and we discussed all three options. Do we want to sell it? Well, no one will buy this. Do we want to close it? Well, if we close it, it impacts our credibility. Right. It impacts our future, where we're going. That's not an option. Not an option. That means we got to fix it. And once we made the decision we were going to fix it, then we had to ask, what's the first thing we need to do? And any ideas what you think was the first action step that needed to be done to fix that business? Leadership. Uh, leadership. Bing, 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 dingo, bingo. <laughs> We've been listening, oh, got Chris. It. <laughs> you got it right. There needed to be a leadership change. Now, that's never an easy thing to do because this individual, they were working hard. This individual should have been able to get the job done, but they just weren't getting the job done. But it was truly a leadership position. So we had to remove that person. And uh, our way of removing that person was put them in a passenger seat, take them towards the airport, open the right door and take a hard left and push. No, I'm just kidding. We didn't do that. <laughs> That's good. But, uh, they did get thrown, but, but they got thrown off the bus. Yep. And the day that they got thrown off the bus, it was required actions that neither Jim, John, nor Terry wanted to do. We had to put forth more time. Now, we were already working hard. We had to put forth more effort. We had to get on more airplanes. We had to undertake more travel. But that business started changing almost immediately. And it became a major contributing factor that contributed to us selling that business for $183 million. And I know for a fact, if we wouldn't have turned that business around, We'd have never been able to sell that business for $183 million and it became a vital business. So the lesson is there's always answers. There's always solutions. 
And no matter what challenge that you're having in this business today, if there's something that really has you under the weather or you're ready to throw in the towel, my encouragement to you is there's answers there. In fact, if someone's in a dire situation, you know, and you feel this is a business ending threat, threatening situation, then call me. I, I'll walk you through it. I don't want anyone to go bankrupt in our industry because as I reference, it's a tough industry. So right. I, I'll help you through that time. So, so if they are, you can find me, you can get to me. Um, Praxis S10. So, uh, and I'm sure yeah. you guys probably have on your website how to get a hold of me. So Correct. Uh, anyway, I, I want you all to be inspired to know you can do that. Now, with that, I am going to touch back on to that uh, comment. And keep in mind, you opened the door on it, not me. Sure. You referenced, and I think it was Chris that you referenced, there's these consultants that are out here. And there's where you have to be very, very careful in this business. There's a lot of people that are self-promoted, self-anointed experts in the industry that have never operated this successful business in this industry. And in many instances, bankrupt companies in this industry. And they're now leading and teaching other people how to be successful because it's easier to make money in this industry than it is to actually go out into the field and make money in the business. And you gotta be very, very careful in listening to these people because there's a lot of those people, including that individual in leadership that I told you was removed from the bus they're out in the marketplace today. They're in the marketplace saying and taking credit that they were president of that organization that I just shared with you that lost a million dollars in a year. And they're that's out. Exactly, that's people. exactly why I'm asking this question, like is because of that type of stuff that's happening. And I'm not going to reference that person's name. In fact, you know, I just amazed that that person can still be out in the industry and I'm amazed that they'll still take credit for, I know what the financial was. And, yeah. but that's all I'll say about it. I'm yeah, and that's, and that's, that's scary, man. Like, because obviously, I mean, who wants that? Like, who, who, I don't want that for anybody. Like, I don't want that for anybody. It's just, I mean, it, it's, fr it, it gets frustrating. And, and I don't necessarily know, I think I have an idea of who you're talking about but I don't want to assume anything, but it's just, in, it's in general, like it's, it's a bummer that, that people are willing to take advantage like that. And, and it's really more of like a sales tactic versus like, it, there's no real depth to it. Right. And who knows? It's, it's just a bummer. And, and I hate it. Cause like, you know, even though whether this is bad advice I got, or I mean, bad advice or not, but I take everything super personal, even though I'm in, I'm in running a business, but I take it super personal because I understand that what we do uh, impacts uh, livelihoods in some aspects. And so I take that very personal. I take it very serious. Um, but I also maintain my core values along the way, integrity, giving back, transparency, like all these things to run our business based on what I think is best for our customers and our employees. But even in my world, same thing, you've got these people that split off and start their own companies and they really don't necessarily know what they're doing or consultants coming in and like judging what they think is right when they really don't know the metrics to look for that's right. And it's kind of the same stuff. It's just, it gets frustrating to, to deal with. And you know what? And the unfortunate part is, is like you and me, you know, we can't spend time focusing on, on them. Like it's just that they're there <laughs> and it's yeah, unfortunate. Absolutely. And, and, you know, that's one of the common things that I hear when people come through our organization for the first time, they'll say, well, I was always taught this. And I said, what was the first thing I told you? Never say I was always taught this. All right. Never say it's always been done this way. I said, it's America. You can do whatever you want. But I'm sharing with you, this is what Jimmy's doing in his business today. Is your business bigger than Jimmy's? If it is, then fine. Do whatever you want. But if it's smaller than Jimmy, I believe in the golden rule. All right. Or the pile theory, I should say. I told you the golden rule last time. I got yeah. another theory called the pile theory. Are you familiar with the pile theory? I am not. I'm not, but I can't wait to hear the pile theory. Who has the biggest pile of money is who I listen to. There you go. <laughs> Bingo. So, so you can argue with me and do it this way of this guy who ran his business or lady ran his business in the ground, or you can do what Jimmy Hiller's doing in his business. And this is what he's doing. I, I'm going to follow the pile. Uh, that actually makes a lot of sense. And is it really a theory? 
at that point. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's a good point. I, I need to that adapt point. that a little bit better because, <laughs> as you preface, praxis is the application of proven knowledge. So, application of proven knowledge is no longer a theory. <laughs> I, two big things I took away. You know, every day you had a bad day at work. You can either close it, fix it, or sell it, and no one does it on their own. So naturally, companies like yours are here to help. That, that's that's my big takeaway. Well, and this, and the, the second piece of that is the solutions in the mirror. Yeah. Um, you know, so that is something I do. Uh, I do love a lot of times. It's not that, and, you, and people will say, oh yeah, I look in the mirror. It's me. Obviously you have to take some sort of action, but you're responsible for taking that action. You're responsible for recognizing that you can, you do have the ability to fix it and you've got the help to fix it. Like Terry graciously saying you can connect with him. Like that's exceptional. Um, but that's what this industry is about. People who have integrity, people who genuinely want to help, um, you know, do like Jer Terry just did. And, and he's not saying, hey, come work with Practice Test. And he's simply saying, give me a call, reach out, see if I can't help guide you in the right direction. So thanks for thanks for saying that, Terry. But you have to look in the mirror and take action. Like, you got to do something with it. We got to wrap. We got, and we got to we got to wrap here, Paul. So I think we're going to, um, we're about a little over, I think we're about a little over an hour into this thing. Uh, we're about an hour and 10 minutes into it. Okay, so I want to finish with this question. Yeah. I don't believe that I asked this the last time, Terry, but it's something I always love asking and finishing with is um, what do you want? What do you want your legacy to be? What is Terry Nicholson's legacy going to be? There would be two. There would be a personal one and the personal one would be to be known as a good father, a good husband and a good son. The business one would be for my clients to say, he helped improve my life and accomplish more than I ever thought was possible in my business. I've achieved a, a growth level I never expected to achieve. I gained the freedom of time I never thought I would achieve. I've created the wealth and had more fun in my life than I ever thought was possible. And I'm thankful to have met Terry Nicholson in that endeavor. And so when the big guy calls my number, if uh, I hear that at the pearly gates, then hallelujah, I can say I've lived a successful life. I love it. Well said. Think of Think, think about this, um, you know, as you're saying those things and I start to think through kind of your overall career, Terry, um, and the people you've been involved with, if I can, I love to talk about, um, you know, giving, giving back. And I, I, I feel like I'm creating this like pyramid scheme of giving back by continuing to push it, helping companies grow and then helping them that, Hey, don't forget to, you know, go and serve in your communities. And I kind of feel like I'm, creating this pyramid scheme of giving back. And that's something I'm super passionate about as I grow companies, as I grow my own business. And as I grow the human beings in my business, um, I want to continue to keep pushing to give back. And that's kind of my like big vision thing of I want to be a part of, but think about this. There's probably literally hundreds of human beings who you've directly impacted their livelihood and their potential to be, you know, to be better and to, and for their families, like you, single-handedly have been able to provide that for human beings like is there any greater like gift than that because to me that is like an amazing gift is to be able to change someone's actual livelihood into being being and doing more have you thought about that well uh yeah i i've thought about that and uh I, I'm just not really exactly sure how to answer, you know, many years ago, and I was smart enough to read a book or fortunate enough that an individual gave me a book and uh, inside the book, and I don't recall what the, the name of the book was, but it said you need to develop your own personal mission statement. And that was back in the 80s. And I wrote down to have an impact on people's lives in the 80s. And then I actually became more sophisticated because I found out that you could have an impact in a negative fashion on a person's life. So I inserted the word positive, right? <laughs> have a positive impact on a person's life. So that's good. That kind of that's personal good. mission statement that I developed in uh, the eighties peak performers. That's the name of the book. Cool. And so that was a book that I read in the eighties. And when I saw that, that was my huge takeaway from it. And so I think that's always kind of been my model as I've gone through life and you're, you're right. That's one of the things that I love about this industry is as I'd share with you, I grew up on a, a farm. I saw the struggles that my parents went through and how difficult it was to be a farmer in the early seventies. And we didn't have much. And, uh, I didn't know we didn't have much because I didn't know there was much to have, but we sure. had love, we had support, we had fun, and we just didn't know that we didn't have much. And so with that, 
the people that I love to work with are the salt of the earth human beings. And the salt of the earth human beings are our traits. They're hardworking, honest individuals that wake up every morning and they want to provide and be the absolute best that they can be and give this great level of service. The majority of people, there's always a few bad apples, but the majority of our industry are good, caring, hardworking people. And I love working with those type of people. And that's really been my motive. That's been my passion. And I just had this conversation yesterday with an individual on an airplane and he asked what I was doing and, and he tried to uh, understand what our business was. And I explained it. And I said, the really, the thing that I do every day when I show up at work, I said, there's always a couple of questions that a contractor, the person I serve, that person wakes up every day and he asks himself this question. How do I grow my business? How do I make more money? How do I get more calls? How do I make uh, or, or provide a better opportunity for my people? That's what my member wakes up and asks every single day on how and I gain freedom of time. I wake up every day and I show up early and I'm asking the question on behalf of my member. What can I do to help them make more money? What can I do to help them get more calls? What can I do to help them gain freedom of time? What can I do to help their people enhance their success? And once I told him that, he goes, I get it. That's got to be a rewarding business. And you're right. I don't know of anything that's any more inspiring and rewarding than helping people achieve their true potential in this business. Perfectly said. And just like that, that's about the perfect closing you can ask for right there. That's well, I fantastic. Think we, hey, Terry. Don't we have a, what's that? Don't we have another, do you have another poem you wanted to close out with? Or was that the one you no, shared? Now, hang on. Yeah. Is, is that, so I was going to, I wanted to go ahead and finish with that. So what I want to do though, too, is just real quick before we get to, I think that's a really great way to uh, segue into close, Paul, is um, I do want you to be able to share that poem. But first, if you would, for our listeners, just go ahead and share like the best contact info to connect with you, Terry, if you don't mind. Well, I'll give you two contacts, uh, 941-210-5610, 941-210-5610. And then my email is Terry, and that's uh, T is in terrific, E-R-R-Y, at Praxis S10. And if I had to do it all over, I'd have an easier email, but Praxis is T is in Paul. You like that, Paul, the way I, I talk? I in it. R <laughs> on brand. A, X is in X ray, I is in igloo, S is in Sam, a second S is in Sam, one zero as on your digital keyboard.com. So it's Terry it. at praxisst10.com. Perfect. Now, if you would indulge us, you said you gave us a great poem earlier. I think it's only right since it's part of your famous signature sign off is to share another poem with us. Would you like to do that, Terry? Oh, absolutely. And this came to be Chris, because uh, one day I was asked, uh, what advice would you want to give your kids if you were on your deathbed and it was the final words of wisdom that you could impart upon your kids. And then one day Jim said, you know, Terry, that applies to our business as well. And it became my signature for virtually every uh, program I've ever given, probably since uh, the late 90s. And so it's my gift that I'll wrap up this with all the listeners today, and I call it the Dreamcatcher poem. Today is here, and tomorrow will come and go. But inside you lies tremendous talents, don't you know? With vision, discipline, belief today, success, joy, and happiness will come your way. The future you live tomorrow is the future you build today. I'm Terry Nicholson, and I'm excited about your future. Thanks for having me here. That a boy, that Terry. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we can make that music hey, happen. Oh, uh, for sure. We had to come up with something, something great of there. Hey, Terry, thank you again for giving us another hour and 15 minutes of your time, man. We're really yeah, grateful. Very grateful. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we can talk Terry into giving a Rhino X uh, 2022. And, uh, um, God, that sure would be great. Like, that'd be pretty neat to bring everybody back together. I know that everybody else, all the others are excited about it when I even brought up the idea or thought about it. But um, I'm certainly grateful that I have not one but two of these episodes with you, Terry. I'm grateful um, for you being willing to share with our listeners and with Tall Paul and myself. So, again, thank you. And, and listeners, obviously, um, the biggest takeaway I have from this, too, again, is, 
you know, as simple as it sounds is sometimes looking in the mirror is, is really the start of a, of a solution to whatever problem that you have. And you're going to have them always on, you know, they're always ongoing. Um, and then to tall Paul's point, you've got like these three options. Um, you either close the business, which by the way, to me would never be an option. Um, and that, I, just quitting is not in my DNA. Um, you know, you can sell it or you can fix it. And if you're at a point where you, the business is failing, and you need to sell it, you're probably going to get much for it. Like, right? so is that what we really want to do? You know, you got to fix it. But sometimes all you got to do is just take a look in the mirror and figure out I'm the problem. I'm the ceiling. I'm the one that can also start to make it happen. And you can take action and do those things. But what you can't do is nothing. So Terry, appreciate you so much, man, and, the, and sharing all your knowledge with us too, and really giving us a phenomenal history lesson throughout the throughout the way. Storytelling makes it so much more fun, and you've certainly got a lot of them to tell. Um, you've just yeah, happened yeah. to do it in, in, in tandem with a lot of the best of the best in the industry. And so it's extremely awesome to hear the story. And again, I thank you so much for, for giving us all the information. So what I want to do though is, is finish and tall Paul, you actually, you want to take us out with the, uh, with the review. And again, listeners, um, if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe to this. You automatically get the podcast sent to you every Tuesday. So then you ain't got to worry about doing anything else. And then of course, share it with your peers. You know, the, the bigger the thing grows, you know, and the more reviews and stuff that we get, it's so encouraging for tall Paul and I to see it again for not only for ourselves, but for the guests and seeing like the impact it's had in the trades that we love so much. So please keep doing those things. And then tall Paul, go ahead and take us out with the review, brother. I don't see a review on the cue sheet. So I'm actually looking at the most recent review that came up on the podcast without being disruptive. And I'm buying time as I find I've got it. it. Chris, I can't find a review. I got you. Don't worry Thank about you. it. So I have it on my, on my thing. So it's actually a uh, five star. It says one call close. Interesting. That's the actual, oh, I like it. That's the actual topic. Okay. So uh, great takeaways for contractors. Chris and Paul do a great job in giving us topical information that we can use in our business today. Great podcast with valuable takeaways. Very simple. Thank you to One Call Close, whoever that is, but I like the Thank name. <laughs> um, unique name. I appreciate that so much. Again, it's like the best, the most rewarding thing you can do. If you ever want to say, hey, thank you, Chris and Tall Paul, and to all your guests for something, that's the best way that you can do it is leave us a review. Yeah. So listeners, we're so incredibly grateful for you. Please go and take action. No zero days. We'll see you.